Next, we have member statements. I recognize the member for Timmins. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you that all of us here in this assembly have been uh, running across the same problem when it comes to access to internet. It doesn't matter if you're an urban member or a rural member, accessing high-speed internet for many people across Ontario is virtually impossible. We've been getting phone calls, as you have on the other side of the house, because children have had to stay home, learn by way of the internet last spring, and they're going to be some of them doing the same thing again. And you have parents that are working at home, and they do not have access to the internet. Places like Connaught, Barbers Bay, Kamaskosha, in my own community, and it'll be the same across Ontario. You have a real problem making sure that people have access to good broadband internet. Now, the government has made announcements that they've got some funding coming, but they keep on announcing the same money over and over again. And we don't see any new towers going up and any remarkable change when it comes to service. So I'm making this following proposition to the government. Why don't we work together in order to make sure that we're able to put together uh, a system that makes some sense to be able to make sure that if you live in Northern Ontario or downtown Toronto or Ottawa, Timmins or wherever it might be, that you can have access to cheap, affordable broadband internet because today the internet is important, important when it comes to being able to do uh, what we do from on a daily basis. We are prepared here to work with you. We're asking you to work with us in order to serve the people of Ontario that we were all elected here to represent. And let's get this problem fixed because it is a real problem across this province. Thank you. Member statements. The member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Friday, our friends south of the border and people across the world marked the 19th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Motivated by evil ideology, September 11th shook all of us to the core. Folks like to say that they remember exactly where they were when the first plane hit the North Tower. Sure, I remember. But where we were matters less. What really mattered in those 60 to 80 critical minutes is where the New York's first responders were. Men and women of the New York and New Jersey Police Departments, the New York and New Jersey Fire, New York paramedics and Port Authority folks, ordinary people who ran into burning towers, into chaos, into an incredible risk, and evacuated and saved thousands of people. Altogether, 343 firefighters, 50 police officers, and a dozen paramedics died inside or at the foot of those magnificent towers. Hundreds more got sick. And they did it not just because they're heroes. They did it because it's their job. They did it because that is the sacrifice that we ask police, firefighters, and paramedics to make for our loved ones, for our friends, for all of us. God bless our police, our fire, and EMS for keeping us safe for running into danger when everyone else runs from it, for serving us every day, not knowing if they'll come home. We owe police, fire, and EMS a debt of gratitude. God bless them, and God bless the memory of all those who perished. Thank you, Speaker. Member statements, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And as Everyone has said we've been hearing from parents across the community. I have some letters, this one from Richard Campbell of Whitby, who wrote, who wrote to this government, as you know, the people of Durham Region and Ontario have worked very hard to make many sacrifices that flatten the curve and continue to reduce and eliminate the prevalence of the COVID-19 virus in our communities. It is critical for students, families, staff, and our economy that we do not erase the progress we have made because of your ministry's plan to reopen schools. Without additional measures, you're risking a second closure of schools, businesses, and our economy, along with the individual social and financial impacts that would come with it. The health and safety of students and staff should be the top priority. As parents of elementary age children, we feel as though we must do everything that we can to ensure that students, parents, guardians, and staff do not have to worry about the return to school. We urge you to do the same. That's from Richard and Whitby. Christy Micklewright writes, my concern comes from the obvious divide in approaches between elementary and secondary grades. It appears that the elementary grades are returning to business as usual, and secondary grades are putting some sort of measures in place to socially distance. It leaves me feeling concerned for the elementary teachers and students, and also leaves me feeling seeing how our elementary teachers are being used primarily as a daycare substitute, and their role as educators is being put to second place. Please reevaluate the elementary return to schools protocol, put more measures in place to allow for social distancing and small cohorts. Speaker Justin Hines, 
is asking this government to do right by the children of Ontario, make up for the shameful lack of planning. We hope that the government will hear these voices and those from across the province reverse course and do right by the children of Ontario. Next, we have the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. I stand here today to posthumously recognize a long-serving and dedicated community worker in Brantford Brant. Anne Keeley Maloche supported the Navy League and Sea Cadet programs in our community, as well as in neighboring Woodstock and Kitchener for over 25 years. She also served as a provincial coordinator of training for the Sea Cadets and director at the provincial level for Navy League cadets. Through her tireless work in the cadet program, she kept hundreds of youth off the streets and out of trouble. Anne was also nominated for several awards and recognitions, but sadly, she passed away August 20th of this year. I spoke to a cadet parent recently, and he told me that his son, who is aging out of Navy League cadets and had no intention of continuing, decided to go and join the Sea Cadets for Mrs. Maloche. I am most impressed with a person who, even in death, is inspiring the youth of Brantford, Brant, and Six Nations into community service, excellence, mentoring younger cadets, and being the best that they can be. Last June, I hosted top cadets for my riding right here in the legislature, and Anne accompanied them. She was absolutely beaming with pride for the eight cadets and commanding officers for their hard work and dedication to our community. On behalf of a grateful community that Anne has served so faithfully, and indeed the entire province of Ontario, she will be dearly missed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'd like to speak about one of the most important and treasured aspects of my riding in Niagara, the grape and wine industry. I always tell people that I have the privilege of representing one of the best ridings in all Ontario, and the wine industry is a big part of that. For decades, we've witnessed the industry in Niagara grow into one of the prized wine regions in North America. However, just like other industries in our province, the grape and wine industry is facing uncertain future. COVID-19 has had a serious negative impact on our small and medium-sized wineries and our grape growers, with restaurants closed and limited shelf space for our local wines at the LCBO stores, the industry has some serious concerns. Not only does the industry produce some of the best, beautiful wines in the world, but also generates jobs and economic activity. Ontario produces 60 to 70 percent of all grapes in Canada, with 93 percent coming from the Niagara region. The wine industry has a $4.4 billion economic impact on the province of Ontario. I believe it's time we listen to this important industry and ensure they have a bright future ahead. Right now, the Ontario wineries, Ontario wineries are paying a 6.1 per cent tax on retail sales, a tax that is not paid by foreign competition you see at the LCBO. It makes absolutely no sense. The Conservative government today needs to step up with support for the grape and wine industry so we can protect jobs, grow the economy, and ensure the future of our great Niagara wines, which I'm sure all my colleagues have drank more than once. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to say a few words in honour of my friend Dave Smith, who recently passed at the age of 87. Born in Ottawa to Russian immigrants, Louis and Annie Smith, Dave was the youngest of 13 children. Dave roots, Dave's roots gave him a strong work ethic, and he built a successful res restaurant and catering business in Ottawa. You may be familiar with Nate's and the place next door. Dave's other passion were his charitable pursuits. Over his lifetime, he raised more than $150 million for dozens of organizations in Canada and around the world. He took special interest in youth addictions and mental health supports. That's how I first met Dave. Because of Dave's leadership, we were able to work collaboratively with a number of organizations to build residential beds at the Dave, youth, Dave Smith Youth Treatment Centre and initiate Ottawa's STEP program, helping young people struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues. The centre is a testament to his compassion and desire to help. Dave understood the meaning of community. You could always count on him. Most importantly, Dave was generous, kind, enthusiastic, 
and a great friend to everyone he knew. We laid Dave to rest on Labor Day, which was fitting because of his lifetime of tireless efforts. To Darlene, Dave's wife of 35 years, his daughter Sharon Ann, his granddaughter Christy, and his many, many, many friends, Dave left an incredible legacy, which will live on. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm honoured to rise in the House today to take a moment and remember a friend who, in August at the age of 35, died of suicide. Over the last six months, COVID-19 has changed our lives. As we continue to battle this global health pandemic together, it's important to recognize its effect on mental health and the toll this new normal uh, we must endure can take. Speaker, I've heard from many friends, family and constituents that they're struggling with loneliness, depression and added levels of stress. While working from home, they found it hard to maintain a healthy work-life balance. While social distancing, they found it difficult to be with the ones they need the most. Speaker, last Thursday was World Suicide Prevention Day, a day to raise awareness that suicide can be prevented. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to remind Ontarians to raise awareness every day, to check in with the colleagues you haven't seen in month, months, to express gratitude to frontline workers working tirelessly away from family and friends, and to lend an ear to a friend who's struggling, stressed, or feeling alone. Asking for help can be hard, Mr. Speaker, but if you or someone you know needs help, please call 247 The Crisis Services Line at 1-833 456-4566 and find resources on connectsontario.ca. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. After months of waiting in pain and discomfort, residents of Nickel Belt and Sudbury were really excited. Health Sciences North had started doing surgery. Appointments were booked, plans were made, and then nothing. Last week, every single elective surgery at Health Sciences North were cancelled. Why were they cancelled, Speaker? Because the hospital was once again at over 100 per cent capacity, while the rest of the province has over 4,500 empty hospital beds. In Sudbury, our hospital is full, and over 30 people sick enough to be admitted into the hospital were in hallways, bathrooms, or in the hospital basement. This government knows that our hospital is too small. They know that we do not have options for long-term care and that our home care system cannot recruit and retain a stable workforce. My constituents, Mr. Ron Bradley, has been told that he needs um, eye surgery, but it will be over one year before he can get it unless he's willing to travel down south. Mr. Bradley is a senior. He needs eye surgery now. Traveling to the GTA is too dangerous for him. Speaker, when will the Ontario government start to look at equitable access to health care in this province? These issues did not pop up overnight. They are long-term problems that this government is not interested in fixing. It's not politically expedient. But, Speaker, every Ontarian deserves equitable access to care, and that includes Ron Bradley and everyone else in Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to recognize the work that the government is doing to create jobs and promote a safe and stable business environment. In the month of August, Ontario has seen its employment increase by approximately 142,000 jobs. Speaker, this is the third straight month of employment increases, which speaks to the incredible work that the government is doing in partnership with hardworking Ontario families and local businesses. And, Speaker, speaking of partnerships, Amazon announced late last week that they will build a 1 million square foot distribution facility, creating 1,000 new jobs in the town of Ajax, and a 354,000 square foot facility in the town of Whitby, with hundreds of uh, full-time jobs. Speaker, that's a solid investment in an area known for its strength and resiliency, where innovation transforms lives. More importantly, Speaker, this great news is a direct reflection of the collaboration that exists between Durham Region's economic development team, the local area municipalities, and the Ontario government. Speaker, the new Amazon facilities are just one more example of how Ontario is still one of the best places in the world 
to do business. Thank you, Speaker. Member statements. The member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On August 14th, my office staff attended a memorial at Bialik Day School just north of my riding of Thornhill to remember and honour the sweet and bright Kira Kagan, whose young life was tragically taken on February 9th as the result of a difficult family situation. As part of the memorial, friends, family and community members shared their fond memories of the short but meaningful time they spent with Kira. To commemorate her life, Bialik unveiled a white friendship bench with a rainbow on it because little Kira loved rainbows, and a bench was chosen to represent the warmth Kira brought to other students each and every day. Adorning the entranceway to her classroom, a colorful rainbow adorned mezuzah was also placed so that she would always be part of her classroom. Though she was only four years old, this little girl left a big impact on many people's lives, including teachers, family, and friends. Dr. Jennifer Kagan is Kira's mother. Since the tragic incident in February, she's been advocating for changes to our family court and law system, not just for her, but also, and I'm quoting, thousands of parents who are engaged in child custody litigation with abusive ex-partners. As Jennifer put it in a letter to me, quote, we need to do better for our children. Thank you. That concludes our member statements for this morning. Before